Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Ethicast. I'm your host, Bill Coffin, and our guests today are James Kukios and Haima Marlier. James and Haima are partners with Morrison Forster, or MOFO, an international law firm with 18 offices around the globe. MOFO advises clients across a range of industries and practices. James is co-chair of MOFO's Securities Litigation Enforcement and White Collar Defense Group and serves as co-head of the firm's FCPA and Global Anti-Corruption Practice. James represents companies and individuals in high stakes government enforcement actions and complex internal investigations. He draws on his experience as a federal prosecutor where he tried over 20 federal jury cases and supervised hundreds of white collar investigations. Haima is also co-chair of MOFO Securities Litigation Enforcement and White Collar Defense Group. Drawing on her experience as a former Securities and Exchange Commission Senior Trial Counsel, Haima represents public and private companies, financial services providers, and individuals in SEC and other government investigations, FINRA investigations, uh, internal investigations, as well as related litigation. James and Haima, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Bill. It's great to be here, Bill. So our topic for the day is third party messaging and in particular SEC and DOJ guidance on it. But before we get into that, let's start from the top of the mountain. What exactly is third party messaging? So I can take that third party messaging very broadly refers to messaging applications that are not manufactured by the developer of the device that you're uh, using. Um, Popular third-party messaging applications include um, WhatsApp, WeChat, Telegram, Signal, Slack, Discord, the chat function of, of Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams. Um, one messaging application that can be overlooked but shouldn't be is also just text messaging, which is a third-party messaging application from the perspective of many organizations. So your text messages are on your smartphone but your organization is not necessarily the um, controller of that, of that data. And I think this topic is really important given um, how ubiquitous this type of communication is today. Just to give a few stats to sort of table set, um, based on recent research we did, 16 million text messages are sent per minute um, for WhatsApp, 100 billion messages are exchanged daily. WeChat has 1.3 billion active users. And we could just go on. We could pick different applications and keep going. But it's an important topic. And um, it, um, I think, is affecting every organization, its employees, its third parties uh, that's out there. I know that the DOJ and the SEC have focused on third-party messaging application communications, but what exactly had they been saying about these? Well, maybe we'd start with DOJ, and it really kind of goes back to 2017. Uh, in 2017, the DOJ Criminal Division released the first version of the FCPA Corporate Enforcement Policy. And among the many things in that document, which was geared towards encouraging companies to self-disclose, cooperate, and remediate FCPA issues, um, one of the things they said in there essentially was companies should ban their employees from using third-party messaging applications. Hmm. Um, that didn't go over very well, probably for the very reasons that, that Haima just mentioned, is that these really have become ubiquitous in our everyday life and in the business community as well in, in many places. Um, and so I think that there was a, a, a justifiable and understandable outcry when that um, FCPA corporate enforcement policy first came out in 2017 with that prohibition. DOJ, to their credit, pretty quickly pivoted on that and released a revised version of the corporate enforcement policy that said, essentially, um, you need to do something about this. Uh, you need to take appropriate steps to govern employees' use of, um, of third-party messaging applications. And it kind of sat there for a while um, with no further guidance. But in 2021, uh, Lisa Monaco, the deputy attorney general, the number two person at the De um, Justice Department, mm -hmm. came forward with more guidance. Um, and, and, and then that peaked in the 2022 Monaco memo. Mm -hmm. 
um, where essentially what DOJ said was, look, there's different ways to do this, but there's three basic elements that you need to put um, into place for your compliance program. You need to have a policy on uh, third-party messaging. You need to train your employees on that policy. And then you need to, um, if you detect violations of that policy, you need to discipline your employees who violate the policy. And other than that, they've given a, a fairly broad range um, for companies to try to fill in those gaps there. And I think that's in recognition of the fact that this is a very complicated subject. As Jaime mentioned, there's a, a lot of different applications. There's different countries that have different privacy regimes. And so kind of going from that 2017 prohibition to now um, kind of minimum standards, but some flexibility in how companies can approach third party messaging when it comes to their um, their employees. One last thing I'll add, of course, before turning over to Haima for the SEC, the, the one other thing that DOJ has emphasized in the Monaco memo um, and, and before that as well, is that it's not only a compliance and governance issue. Um, you know, they think that obviously, and I think for good reason, that companies to have an effective compliance program need to have these kind of policies in place, but they're also concerned about how it could impact investigations. And so what DOJ has also said is that in order to get full cooperation credit, you have to have in place um, policies and procedures to be able to preserve and access, and for their point, produce to them um, third-party messages that their employees may be using as well. So um, very uh, recently, especially a very large focus on third-party messaging from the Department of Justice. To turn to the SEC side, um, the way the SEC has viewed this, this issue stems from the SEC's very broad definition, which is consistent with what's used in civil litigation of what is a document. So when the SEC issues a subpoena or an inquiry and asks you for all documents, which include communications about a particular topic, it has been the longstanding practice of the SEC to understand that that can incorporate early on things like text messages. Text messaging has been with us for, for some time now. Indeed, if we look at the um, the wave of insider trading cases, which made so much news probably about, you know, 10 to 10 to 15 years ago, yeah. some of the key evidence used in those cases was texts and also chats on Bloomberg terminals um, between people. The Bloomberg terminal is a very interesting one because how that works is it's a separate, or at least it used to be a separate device yeah. that's controlled by Bloomberg that folks used to chat on. And um, that was evidence that the SEC you know, would, would seek and would use. Um, yeah. Particularly on third-party messaging applications, the clearest guidance, in my view, really started to emerge in the fall of 2021. And that's when the SEC's um, uh, director of the Division of Enforcement, Gerbier Graywall, um, gave a, a pretty direct speech where he said that companies that fail to preserve and produce to the SEC third-party messaging application communications, here's his quote, delay and obstruct investigations, and they raise broader accountability, integrity, and spoliation issues. That's very direct. Spoliation is a serious issue. Yeah. There can be severe penalties to um, companies and individuals that spoliate. He went on to say something very similar to what to where James said the DOJ ended up landing, which is companies need to, to need to actively think about and address um, compliance issues raised by their employees' use of third-party messaging application communications and other off-channel communications. So again, just to pick up on something what James said, I think where we land is sort of a practical approach by the SEC they're not saying don't do it. They recognize it is with us and it's part of how many companies have to do business. I think we'll get into this a little bit later, but in certain regions of the world, very difficult to do business if you're not using these types of communications. The SEC is just saying, come up with a framework, come up with policies and come up with um, you know, a way to address compliance issues that may arise uh, from this. So that's where the SEC's at 
one last thing on what Graywall says, because it's just such a great example in this speech. The speech is from October 6, 2021. It's on the SEC's website. It's very fun read. He gives <laughs> two examples that um, um, should kind of stick with us. He mentions that his young daughter and her grandmother, so his mother and his daughter, have been texting for like, so I forget what he says, but it's like over a decade now. So his point is it should surprise no one that the SEC knows that there are text messages out there, you know, all generations of people to go back to that, you know, to go back to the comment about the ubiquitous nature of this are using these communications. He also used an interesting speed limit example on compliance, which is that he gave, so I'm from Jersey, so he of course refers to, and he is too, so he uses a Jersey Turnpike example. You speed on the Jersey Turnpike, you're breaking the law. But when you do it day after day after day, it doesn't really feel like you're doing anything wrong. You just drive 75 on the Jersey Turnpike and that's how you get home. That's how he wants organizations to look at this compliance issue. Just because these are all around us and they're everywhere doesn't mean we can be like, oh, we're cool. Like we're just going 75 on the turnpike and that's what everybody does. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great example. I'm from New Jersey as well. And speeding is practically the national sport here. So that's, that's, a, great, <laughs> that's, a, that's a terrific example. So is the focus on third party messaging a new development or have we just seen an uptick in enforcement actions and compliance guidance related to these issues as of late? Yeah, I think for the DOJ side to start with that again, Bill, um, it, it's not new, but I'd say it's more of an evolution. And I kind of talked about 2017 to today, but I'll, maybe I'll step back a little bit before that, you know, when I became an FCPA prosecutor in 2009, it was sort of the heyday of Gmail. Um, you know, em employees who wanted to do things wrong had figured out they can't send emails on their corporate email accounts because they knew that uh, that by that point they knew that the corporate email accounts were accessible by the by the company and and by the um, the outside lawyers. And so they couldn't do that. So a lot of people started shifting over to Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail or whatever it may be. Um, 2009, I think, was Gmail was was the most popular, but they were starting to use use that quite a bit. Um, and that was great for us because uh, all those servers were based in the United States. The servers were in the United States. We'd get an email address. We'd go out and get a search warrant, uh, and then we get all their messages. And if you kind of look back, if you go back to some of the enforcement actions from the you know, 2009, 2015 um, era, you'll see lots of Gmails uh, referenced in those. Um, yeah. And you know, we would, for example, when we start an investigation with a company say, all right, thanks, but first thing we want you to do, go look for um, personal email addresses and get those to us. And we would send a preservation letter to the provider and then we go later on if possible and get a search warrant for those and it was great it was fantastic but you know just like it's a cat and mouse game and people started figuring out oh you know they can get our gmails or or maybe it's just a convenience thing you know gmail takes time you know you have to send it and then you have to wait for it to come through and things like that and so the technology was really started shifting away from personal email um, addresses to third-party messaging apps and I think DOJ started to see that in their cases. And I think if, if I'm, a, I'm speculating, because I was gone by this point, um, when, I, when I left, they were just, we were just starting to come to grips with the fact that things were really moving over towards messaging apps and that we might not be able to get those as easily as we were with uh, Gmail and Yahoo and Hotmail. Um, and so if I'm speculating, but reason speculation, I think part of that 2017, 2017 message by DOJ that companies, you need to stop your employees from using those um, was in part because they were concerned that they these messaging apps were being used for nefarious purposes, but also that DOJ was no longer able to get those as easily. Um, you know, even WhatsApp, which is US based, is, is harder for DOJ to get than Gmail was. And then you get into WeChat or Signal or any of the ones that are not US based, it might be impossible. And so I think this was more of a recognition on DOJ's part from two aspects. Number one, companies, you should know that your employees are starting to use these lines of communication to do um, sometimes nefarious things, oftentimes not, but sometimes nefarious things. And for you to be able to investigate and for us to be able to investigate, you need to get a control, um, get control over these, these things so that we can preserve those and get those. Um, I, I'll say um, uh, one of the first times I saw this in a DOJ FCPA enforcement action, there was a long um, complaint affidavit 
justifying the arrest of, of a, a person suspected of, a, of an FCPA violation. And there was a footnote in there by the agent that said, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, but this was the gist, uh, based on my training and experience, um, criminals love instant messages because that's how they get away with their crimes. Um, and that was sort of, I think, really reflective of the, the viewpoint of um, DOJ and FBI and law enforcement in 2016, 2017. That has evolved, as we've talked about over the years, and that sort of led to this um, more engagement, I think, with the business community on, okay, we understand that, that a lot of legitimate business is done over these um, programs, but we need to get, uh, again, a handle on these, a control on these for both compliance and investigative purposes. And that's why we're hearing, even though it's not a new issue, I think we're hearing more discussion about it because of that. Turning yeah. to the FTC side, there's a well-known huge uptick in enforcement actions in this mm -hmm. space. That falls actually into two categories. One is the well-known category. So that's the Wall Street sweep that I'll go into in a second. The other is lesser known, but actually is broader and it's more important. To start with what what, what really does make the news and, and most folks that are interested in this space are very well aware of is the SEC and CFTC have gotten a combined 2.2 billion B with penalties so far. Uh, and the cases still keep coming. The most recent cases were just last month, May 2023, against broker dealers and registered investment advisors for failure to preserve um, employees, what the SEC says, pervasive off-channel communications, including text messaging, WhatsApp, WeChat, et cetera. Um, the SEC's focus was that many of these third-party messaging communications, including by very senior executives at some of these institutions, were sent on personal devices, so not on their firm-issued broker-dealer. So certainly that the eye, just the eye-popping size and some of, the, some of the banks that were involved in this caught everyone's attention. I think, however, um, what has been less well-known but is actually more important is that because of what James was saying from the Monaco memo and the expectations, this is not just an issue, um, a compliance issue for SEC registrants. It is a compliance issue for every organization that does any form of business in the United States, public or private. Any organization can be on the receiving end of an SEC or in the case of James' line of work, DOJ inquiry or subpoena. And those agencies have now been very clear. It's not a new issue. We're going on years of this now. They've been very clear that they expect a compliance framework to be um, in place. So um, one thing that sometimes when we have these discussions, um, uh, clients and potential clients are surprised at is that um, they think, well, I'm not an SEC registrant. We are a public company or we are a private company. You know, what, how does this apply to us? Um, it does, and the risks can be quite severe, at least on the SEC side. The result of the Wall Street sweep means that SEC staff attorneys, those sort of frontline folks that investigate these types of matters, are very conversant and very knowledgeable on how these applications work, what they are used for, how to collect them, how long they're preserved, all of that good stuff that perhaps wasn't the case, you know, let's say seven years ago or, or more. Yeah. Are there any applications that really stick out uh, as being of particular regulatory concern? The big one that is of regulatory, and I would probably say government concern, uh, would be any form of ephemeral messaging. The government is very suspicious of ephemeral. And by ephemeral, we mean like think of your teenager in Snapchat. Right? right, unless someone screenshots the Snapchat, um, that's going to be gone, and that's that's why they that's why they love it. Um, so there's going to be a little antenna that goes up on on the part of any government staffer looking into something when there's ephemeral messaging involved. As far as other applications, um, this is where the compliance structure really needs to fit the organization that's trying to implement it. For some organizations, they're going to be able to shake out at like no third party messaging applications, period. It's not necessary to our business. It exposes us to risk. Can't do it. On the way other side of the spectrum, especially for large 
um, multinational corporations, they're going to find that for a lot of their sales practices and procedures, it is impossible for them to not use certain applications. Um, so they're going to make their decisions on which applications they're comfortable with and, and which they're not. All right. So are there any geographical differences or considerations worth noting when it comes to the use of third party messaging? Yeah, absolutely. I think anybody who's in a multinational company knows that if you're in China, uh, you need WeChat. Uh, people do everything in their in their lives about WeChat. And we, you know, oftentimes we speak to our clients or we, we connect with our clients through WeChat just because it's such a, an ingrained part of everyday life in China now. Same thing with WhatsApp in several countries like Brazil or India. Uh, WhatsApp is really ubiquitous in those countries. Uh, oftentimes, for example, it's uh, in some of the remote areas, they may have bad cell service, but they have great um, Wi-Fi. And you can just get on to, to um, WhatsApp through a Wi-Fi connection and be able to have voice and text communications very easily. And so those have become, and I think also some people um, in countries where they don't necessarily trust the government, um, they think that these encrypted types of um, applications are much safer to use. And that would include, I've heard it in Brazil as well. That's one of the reasons why it's so popular, but, but uh, other places as well. Um, and so, I, and I think we'll talk about this a little later in this um, episode, but you know, one of the best practices for companies is really to try to understand um, where they're doing business and in those areas where they're doing business, what are the applications that their employees are using um, so they can get a better handle on those and implement um, compliance programs around those. Are there any regulatory investigations, matters, or resolutions worth discussing that really highlight regulators' concerns about the use of third-party messaging? So um, one is one that we've already discussed during this episode, and that's the SEC's Wall Street sweep. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to the SEC's website, they have a listing of all of the companies they have charged thus far, the settlement amounts, and you'll see that the types of applications and how they were used is all different. But the common thread is that there was a failure to um, preserve as these banks were required to the, the, the records um, on the on the banks systems. There have also been um, some uh, pretty significant sanctions in civil litigation. So for example, um, earlier this year in a multi-district litigation, um, a large tech company was sanctioned for spoliation of um, certain chats that were on the company's um, servers. This is an interesting one. So this isn't a case of a smartphone with an application that's only accessible if you image that phone. This is this would be like a Zoom, a chats in Zoom or Teams or Google. And what happened there was um, litigation began against this uh, company and the company sent out litigation holds and things like that, but it did not preserve the chats. And so um, you can kind of, um, uh, uh, see maybe what had happened is, of course, they know that we have to preserve um, emails and, you know, sh SharePoint sites where employees work together, documents. And, you know, for whatever reason, these chats were kind of an oversight and were not um, preserved. So that's a recent example. Um, you know, I know, I know we're talking mostly here about the government and what the consequences can be with the SEC and the DOJ. But um, once, um, especially for public companies, um, shareholders or um, others see that there is an SEC or a DOJ inquiry, there's often this follow on civil litigation. And now it's clear that this is this is an issue for that as well. From the DOJ perspective, I don't know of any um, resolutions like the ones that, that Jaime mentioned for the SEC. Th this is what I've been observing. If you go to especially to, for example, FCPA enforcement actions, um, you will see in the statement of facts where DOJ specifically calls out when the, and I'll use the term uh, bad guys um, just as a shorthand, but you'll see um, the DOJ will specifically call out in the statement of facts when the bad guys have used third party messaging applications in furtherance of the bribery scheme. And there's several reasons why they do that. One is just um, jurisdictional. You know, oftentimes those give you the jurisdictional hook because they're 
US based or they pass through the US or something that you need for an FCPA violation. Um, second, it's just great evidence. I mean, it's always better to have the defendant's own words uh, being used against them in those things. But I think third and, and most important for this um, particular episode is that is also a message to the business community that you know we've told you that the employees have been using these um, to, to for at least in part nefarious reasons and that you need to get a handle on this. Let us give you some concrete examples of how it's being used. And oftentimes they'll name the third party messaging application as well. And again, I think this is a, a very clear signal that DOJ is trying to send, send to the business community. This is not empty talk. We're not concerned about this for no reason. They yeah. people are using these third party messaging applications to commit bribery that you don't know about. And we want to tell you about this. So you take us seriously and you do something about this. And I think that's, um, it's always whenever I'm reading, I, I talked about that first one I ever saw with that footnote by the FBI agent in the plate affidavit. Yeah. Um, it's a constant stream since then. If you and I think it's really what, worth reading those um, FCP enforcement actions. With that in mind, you know why is DOJ mentioning these third-party messaging applications? And it's to send the business community a, a, a wake-up call, I'd say, about how these are being used. Can you discuss some of the risks associated with the company's failure to provide a means to retain and access business communications on personal devices and third-party messaging apps? So the risks are are really enormous. That it, yeah. it just can't be understated. Um, I'll go through some internal risks that an organization can face and go through some civil external risks and then turn it over to James who can discuss this from the criminal um, the criminal perspective. Internally, I think there are two important risks. So let's say that there's no government inquiry. It's just business in the ordinary course. Why should I care about this? Internally, the two main risks are your organization, your company could lose relevant data. You don't know what you may need it for. You may never need it for a government facing purpose, but it may be that it's important for you to have that data. The second risk is that there's an inability to monitor your employee's conduct. James was just giving examples about, um, for example, bribery. It's not like, you know, someone who's committing bribes, everyone in the organization, all the way up to the legal department and senior management know about that. If you don't have a compliance framework in place for third party messaging applications, you are losing your ability to monitor your employees con conduct and make sure it's not only consistent with the law, but consistent with the values of your organization. For some of the external contact, uh, external consequences on the civil side, there's just it's a it's a laundry list, really. Um, risks include the loss of cooperation credit if you are facing an SEC inquiry or investigation. Um, the SEC can bring a range of um, violations related to a failure to preserve relevant communications. There can be books and records violations, failure to supervise internal controls violations. The SEC can seek civil penalties. They can take adverse inferences against um, the organization. The organization courts could later preclude you from using certain defenses if, in fact, the defense is based on some kind of evidence that you failed to preserve, even though you had a duty to um, do so. As we discussed in the context of the case that I just mentioned, there can be sanctions for spoliation, um, the most severe sanction of which would be a default judgment against you in a civil litigation. And then finally, I think a very important external um, consequence is there can be a lot of reputational damage to an organization when um, there's a failure to preserve relevant information. I'll, I'll turn it over to James to discuss it from the criminal perspective. Yeah, I think a lot of what I'm going to say echoes exactly what uh, Jaime said. Um, start out with the, the loss of internal governments. You know, we've seen in investigations recently We've done the email review, um, you know, we've done all this, but and we don't see anything. But then we're lucky enough to be able to get the, the employee's cell phone, um, maybe because it's a it's not a bring your own device, but it's actually a government issued I mean, a company issued cell phone. We're able to get that. And sure enough, you open up the third party messaging, and there it is. Um, you know, the thing that we were looking for was actually there. Uh, and had we not been able to get those. Um, those text messages, or uh, we wouldn't have known that, we wouldn't have been able to see that. So I think 
that's a, a really concrete example of the loss of internal control. From a DOJ and government enforcement perspective, if you don't have that, but the government does, you're at a huge disadvantage when you're going into an investigation. And, and one common thing that we see often is that whistleblowers um, will take screenshots of their WeChat conversations and they'll email them to the company or worse for the company, they'll email them to the enforcement agencies and say, look, this is what's been going, this is what's been going on on WeChat. This is what's been going on with Snapchat. And then the government has that and you don't. Um, and that really puts you at a disadvantage when you're conducting an investigation or you're negotiating with the government about what the, um, what the evidence might show. You know what? One thing I always get a pit in my stomach when I'm, when I'm talking to the government is I've done a lot of work. I've interviewed, you know, 70 witnesses. I've, you know, re reviewed a million documents and we haven't seen anything, but they're so confident that there's something there. And, you know, in the back of my head, I'm wondering, did they get somebody's cell phone? Is there a cooperator who gave them the cell phone that has all those third-party messaging apps that we weren't able to, to access? Um, and so you really do lose control, um, both from an internal government standpoint, but from a, from a negotiation standpoint with the government as well. The, there can also be some more direct consequences. Um, in the DOJ guidance, um, they do state, as I mentioned before, that to get full cooperation credit, one thing you need to do is to be able to, um, to access, preserve, and then ultimately produce to the government um, third-party messaging apps. And one question they've been asking a lot lately, and it's in the guidance, is DOJ will ask, have there been times where an investigation has been impacted because you've not been able to obtain third-party messaging, um, uh, third-party messages? Mm -hmm. And that can affect you not only the cooperation prong, uh, but also on the compliance program prong. And so there can be some really kind of direct monetary, uh, if you do have an enforcement action, you can lose some of those credits, which will result in a higher penalty and potentially bad enough, um, maybe enhanced compliance requirements as well. So there's definitely um, some very tangible risks associated with a company's failure to provide a means to retain and access these types of communications. So if you could boil it down to just a few points, what would you generally consider to be best practices to minimize regulatory risks and exposure on third party messaging? If there's any takeaway from my perspective from this podcast, it's that the culture of compliance within an organization is so important. Uh, I had the privilege of attending the Ethisphere conference this year. And one thing that was really interesting that came out of this particular topic, third party messaging applications, was that um, compliance departments at certain organizations, you know, in, in times past, had been these departments that were raising issues, but kind of couldn't get traction on some of the compliance frameworks that they wanted to set up. In most organizations, that day is no more. Folks are listening to their compliance um, professionals, and those people can be a huge value add. Uh, the amount of money you'll spend on a compliance framework now is nothing compared to when James or I get involved and there are 70 witness interviews and a million documents and we're trying to negotiate. Uh, for the government. You can really, these people are, have immense potential to add value for, for your organization. I think there are really um, four things, interesting to see if, if James agrees, and I can kind of tackle two of them and then pass the mic. Um, the, the four best practices are some kind of risk assessment um, of where we are now, then establishing or enhancing policies and procedures based on the risk assessment. That would be the second. Third, conduct training on whatever you do. And fourth, have, James alluded to this earlier, have some kind of monitoring, like know what your employees are actually doing. So I'll just take the first two of those really quick. What a risk assessment would involve is organizations need to determine the nature and the extent of third-party messaging application use by their employees. As we said earlier, for some organizations, it's gonna be like, not that much, not necessary for business. That's almost easy. I think that's going to be the rare organization in our world today. Once you determine the use, you can conduct a risk assessment and do things like what apps should and shouldn't employees be allowed to use, but try to figure out what's going to work and put some parameters around it. Um, on the policies and procedures point, the second take, second takeaway is um, organizations need to revisit 
or in the case of organizations that don't have them, they need to establish clear policies governing employee use of third party messaging applications for business purposes. Uh, that's something I haven't emphasized enough. It should be obvious from the podcast. We're not suggesting you could like monitor your employees' personal yeah. use of applications. This is their, their business yeah. use. Then um, those organizations working closely with their compliance departments, often um, organizations engage external counsel like MOFO or other firms to um, design policies to um, fit not only their business, but their risk profile. The risk profile of every organization is, is going to be different. I think I um, totally agree with your first two points. I think for training, um, that's a relatively easy thing that companies can do. Um, work this into your annual training program, um, that not only your anti-corruption and those types of training, but your IT management policy training as well to do this. And then importantly, keep a record of it. Um, show that you have trained people. You know, there's a, lots of best practices in training in terms of quizzes and things of that nature, which I think can really help as well. And, and to be able to show those to enforcement agencies if you need to. Look, we have 98% compliance with our training. People have to you know, pass this exam. So we, ha we are very confident that people know about this policy through, through our training. I think that's relatively easy in concept, at least. The next one, um, monitoring and discipline is very difficult. Um, you know, we're not necessarily at a point where technology permits that very easily and where privacy laws can really um, interfere with those efforts. And I think companies are really struggling with that right now. Um, some of the things that I've heard companies doing are they'll, they'll do audits and as part of the audit, they'll sit down with employees and just ask them, you know, what are you using? Can I look at your phone? Um, mm -hmm. That type of thing that of course, depends highly on whether the employee is willing to do that or not um, and what the local labor and privacy laws may be. Another thing companies are doing is when they conduct an internal investigation, they'll have now a module built into their questions about um, the use of third party messaging applications and whether the um, employee was willing to share those um, with with the investigator. Um, and then maybe you can get some data and, and potentially um, use that for some disciplinary actions. But I think all these things are evolving right now and companies are very struggling or struggling with things like the technology to be able to, to do this um, with the data privacy and labor laws around the world and even in different U.S. states around this. So it's very difficult. However, and I think this is a really important message that DOJ has sent, just because it's difficult doesn't mean you can ignore it. And I think one of the most important things in the in the Monaco memo and the recent guidance coming from DOJ is um, companies can't just say this is hard, throw their hands in the air and say so we're not going to do anything. And I actually felt kind of good. I was at a conference recently because I wrote that in a in a in a client alert, and I was at a conference recently, and a DOJ official said, "So what we're saying is you can't just throw your hands in the air and say it's too hard." And I said, "I got that." Um, I like it. That was my analogy. Yay. Um, you know, broken clock is right twice a day. Um, but I was pretty happy about it. But I think that's the point. I think at this point, um, especially given that history we've talked about where they kind of overreact in 2017 and kind of backed off, they are actually, a lot of what they're saying right now, DOJ, is um, that they understand the difficulty and they are open to different approaches and are recognizing the limitations that companies face. And so the most important thing right now is to take those steps that Haima talked about um, and have a good faith, articulable um, reason for why you have constructed your compliance program around third party messaging the way you did. Mm -hmm. It may not be perfect. It's not going to be perfect. There's too much uh, in development right now. Um, there's too many different labor laws and privacy laws and technologies out there. But to be able to say, you know, we did that risk assessment. Um, based on that risk assessment, we we came up with what we thought was a reasonable policy. We trained on that, and then we did steps to monitor and discipline on that. If you have a, an articulable story, a good story about that, I think DOJ, at least at the moment, is pretty open to those right now. And so, as Haima said, putting that investment in now to try to get a, a handle on those things can really pay off in the long run if you find yourself before the agencies trying to have to justify something that happened. So 
um, the, the, the old saying about an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, I think really does apply as well in this, uh, in this arena as well. James and Haima, this is such a fascinating topic, and I really appreciate how deep you dove into it uh, in this episode. So thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. Thanks, Bill. It's been great. Thank you for having us. Well, to keep up with the latest legal and industry insights, news, and events from MoFo, please visit mofo.com slash resources. I'm Bill Coffin, and this has been The Ethicast. For more episodes, please visit youtube.com slash ethosphere or visit Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Amazon Music. And as always, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.